Um, so Logan and I took a ride yesterday, and it was the coolest lift I've ever ordered in my life. Do we have, I think we have a photo of this somewhere. Oh, here we go. Um, so explain what happened yesterday, Logan. What, what is this 1963 Bentley doing in Austin this weekend? So we, uh, every year we like to do something a little bit fun uh, for South By. This is actually the first year we were allowed to operate with cars on the road. Uh, so to make it a little extra special, we launched Magic Mode. Uh, so you click a button, same sort of standard lift experience, except you don't know what you're going to get. Uh, you're going to get one of, I think we had nine different uh, mostly retro cars on the road. This is a 1960s Bentley. Uh, and we had, uh, there were a couple newer cars. There was a retro Mini Cooper. Uh, there was a new uh, Tesla on the road. And also the, the driver was, was, a, was an active Lyft driver who yeah. was just so excited to do this and was loving every second of this. And she even brought a little can of Grey Poupon for our ride, which I thought was a nice, <laughs> a nice touch. Is South By a good return on your investment? You've been kind of one of the active kind of marketers here, and you've always tried to build a presence over here for several years. Do you get kind of a, a good return on what you do here at South By? Yeah, you know, we, we've been, my co-founder and I have been coming here for the last uh, few years, and even before Lyft, uh, and it's always been so much fun uh, that each year we try and think of something that's a little off the wall. Uh, so the, the first year we were here with Lyft, we did uh, lift piggyback rides, so we couldn't give rides in proper cars. Uh, so we decided to take the idea of lift as, you know, uh, very personal transportation mm -hmm. to the extreme. And we had a crew of people giving piggyback rides around the city. Sounds tiring. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out you couldn't get very far on one. But, um, and then last year we did a, a little something with like a, a recess sort of session. Um, anyway. You know, it's hard to measure the exact return. What are you trying to do? You're trying to build awareness, add users, add drivers? You know, I think we're, we're here, we're having fun. We're just sort of trying to, to give back to that, that same, you know, experience that, that we get when we come here. Yeah. Um, cool. So, so Lyft in 2015, um, this is a big deal now. A lot of people, how many people in the, the room, raise your hands, have ever tried a Lyft? All right. It's the vast majority of people here. Um, I, think, I think there's kind of a, a curve right now happening with um, ride sharing, and it's, it's, it's becoming a part of life for a lot of people. Um, Lyft was recently valued in a funding round at $2.5 billion. This is a big deal, but it took a long time to get here. So I want to hear kind of the story. Um, you know, what are the roots of Lyft, and how did you come up with this idea? How do we get to where we are right now? Yeah. So uh, it goes back to, to where I grew up. I grew up down in LA. And uh, LA is you know, some of the worst traffic in the world. It's, it's one of these cities that was uh, built in the age of the automobile. So it was really built around cars. Whereas you know, cities that have been around for longer are more built around people. Uh, but I had this experience that anyone who's spent time in, you know, in LA has had, where you're sitting there probably stuck on the 405, uh, going nowhere and looking around and seeing one person in every car and four empty seats. And uh, that just kind of scarred me. I think I've been like working back from this like, traumatic childhood of uh, too many hours in traffic. But it, this idea just stuck with me that if we could get more people, that if we could fill a few of those empty seats and take just a handful of those cars off the road, that we could eliminate traffic and that you could uh, you know, completely changed the way people get around a city. So uh, when I went up, I went to school at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I left my car at home, and I really wanted to create an experiment out of my life. So I wanted to feel, you know, what's it, what's it like to not have a car and need to get somewhere? Uh, you know, short notice. Uh, what are the options like? How good is public transportation? <laughs> and you know, so I rode the bus everywhere. I took Amtrak and Greyhound, and uh, really kind of learned what you know, what the options were like. What did you learn about Greyhound? <laughs> I learned uh, the buses break down fairly often, <laughs> and I learned that uh, when you get out of LA County Jail, they give you a Greyhound ticket <laughs> to get home. Uh, so I had some, some interesting conversations on Greyhound. Uh, and, and so it got me kind of started uh, what's now, you know, looking like a, you know, a lifelong, uh, you know, career in transportation. I, uh, was appointed to the board of a local public transit district. And I got on the board. I was the only one who actually rode the bus. Everyone else who was sort of retired ex-city council members, uh, you know, they would show up to the meeting in their SUV. And 
And so I was, you know, got on, rode the bus, was like super enthusiastic. I'm going to fix public transportation. We're going to get more people riding the bus. The, the sad statistic is that uh, only 5% of people take the bus to work. The other, you know, 90 something percent uh, drive. Most of them drive alone. And so I thought, if we could fix. And that's a national stat? Or that's, that's a national a, okay. stat, yeah. I thought if, if we could fix public transportation in Santa Barbara, you know, if I could figure out the model here, we could you know, spread this around the country. What's the trick? How do you make routes more efficient? How do you, you know, set the prices correctly? Uh, and after three years on this board, I had accomplished nothing. Um, I realized that the way that public transit is funded, um, it's the, each district is essentially forced to lose money on every trip they provide. So when you get on the bus and you pay your $2, that covers about 30% of the cost of the trip. <laughs> and the rest comes from subsidy. So what, what happens is you can have uh, you know, a bus that's overflowing with people, and it's still not profitable. The district's still losing money on that route. And, and so after this, this time on the board, um, I took a trip just for fun. I was traveling around Southern Africa and went into Zimbabwe. Uh, and I saw in Zimbabwe, nobody could afford to drive. So it was nothing like LA. The streets were empty and mm -hmm. quiet. Uh, and the government you know, provided no services. Like Public transportation was nowhere on their list of priorities. Uh, so out of this world of necessity, um, they'd created this grassroots public transit network where an entrepreneur would get a small bus and form a route, and they'd set market prices. Uh, and if there was a need for another route, another entrepreneur would see the opportunity and start another route. And it worked. And you know, comparing what you know, Zimbabwe had a higher level of service than we did in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is you know fairly affluent city. So I came back, you know, just you know, enamored with this idea of <clears throat> rebuilding a public transit system and taking advantage of the fact that in the U.S. everybody has a car or two, um, and to use every single driver on the road as a node in that transit network. And so this led to the creation of Zimride. What was Zimride? So, uh, so we launched Zimride in 2007, uh, unfortunately a few months before the iPhone came out. So Zimride was a, a web-based uh, hmm. ride-sharing service. Mm -hmm. uh, you would go online, you'd post the trip you were taking, how many seats you had, how much you wanted to get paid per seat, and other people would search for your ride, sort of check out your profile, see if your friends had come, and see if they felt comfortable sharing a ride with you message you, go back and forth. The problem was uh, when people want transportation, they, they want it now. They don't want to have to go online and plan for several days. Mm -hmm. So with, with Zimride, we, we found sort of a niche market with college kids sharing rides home on weekends. And that was like the group that would go online and spend a couple days organizing transportation to save 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, built a small business around that. We spent about five and a half years building Zimride. You and, and your current yeah. co-founder, Lyft, John Zimmer. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was a, you know, a, a good small business, but by no means was it having this, you know, we wanted to shake up the world. We wanted to create a new form of transportation. You know, the, the vision was, you know, we want to solve traffic. We want to you know, make it optional. In most cities, you have to have a car to get around. We wanted to make a transportation service that was so good that you didn't need to own a car. Mm -hmm. And you know, Zimride was not having the level of impact that we wanted. And in the meantime, you know, everybody all of a sudden had a phone in their pocket. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting there trying to figure out, OK, how do we have this impact? And you know, what's the Zimride sort of mobile plug? And, and what year is this? This is 2012. OK. So there is an Uber at this point. There is an Uber at this point. Uber is. Uh, only doing sort of black town cars. Right. Uh, they have one mode. And, and so we, we say, OK, let's, we, we originally were going to call it Zimride Instant. So let's launch Zimride Instant. Let's take all of the work out of Zimride. So instead of checking out someone's profile, seeing if you feel comfortable with them, let's run the most stringent criminal background checks on every driver. Let's run DMV record checks. Let's do vehicle inspections and you know, meet every driver in person to vet them. Uh, let's take all of the guesswork out of it and make it safer than hopping in a taxi or a limo. 
And so, and I think I think people are starting to get accustomed to this idea. But back in in 2012, yeah. the idea of just jumping into a car with a stranger was very kind of alarming to a lot of people, right? Yeah, people the the reactions were, you know uh, were all over the map, but but most people were not excited about the idea. Uh, there was luckily a contingent of people that that really was, and once. You, you took a lift and you understood what it was once you understood sort of the rigorous onboarding process. Uh, everybody would come around. Uh, the repeat rates were just through the roof. And, and it just took that kind of one experience saying, oh my God, this is you know, an incredibly you know, friendly driver. I feel you know, more safe with this person than I would in, you know, in anything else. Um, but yeah, in the, in the beginning, you know, our, our board thought it was slightly crazy. They said, "Your you board know, at Zimride." Our board at Zimride. Yeah, we went to them and said, "Hey, we've got this really crazy idea. You know, we want to launch it. Um, what do you think?" I said, "Does anyone want to do that?" Uh, and from our experience with with Zimride, we knew that wasn't the the issue. We knew that people uh, people would feel comfortable doing this. So, was that reaction from your board part of the reason that you decided to start this as a separate company, or why why to start a new company as opposed to continue to do? Zimride Instant. Yeah, so when we've, so, so Zimride Instant, yeah, we, we changed the name just before we launched and turned it into Lyft. Uh, and we did it, yeah, as a, one, we, we thought we needed a better brand than Zimride Instant. Uh, nobody internally thought that was a good name. Mm -hmm. uh, and and Lyft, Lyft really stuck. Uh, but yeah, we did it as an experiment, you know, honestly, not knowing whether or not people wanted this or if this would take off. Um, and there was all sorts of re regulatory uncertainty around it as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were not regulations, you know, sort of clearly outlining this type of service in any market that we launched. So everywhere we went, uh, we had to sort of create a brand new regulatory category. And this is still the case for, for most places that you operate. Yeah, this is still the case. Yeah. I was just, uh, just before this, I was, you know, meeting with folks in the Texas legislature talking mm -hmm. about uh, everything that's going on in, in Texas. Uh, so we've passed new regulations in uh, 30 different jurisdictions. So in some places at the city level, other places at the state level, mm -hmm. but 30 different jurisdictions. And we plan uh, in 2015 to probably pass uh, you know, another 30 p mm -hmm. pieces of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get back to regulation, but, but staying with the creation story of Lyft, I think everyone wants to know where does the pick mustache come from? Whose idea was that? Yeah, so that was, that was my co-founder John's idea. Uh, so there's a separate company, believe it or not, uh, that made mustaches. They were called Carstash. Uh, and we came across them maybe in 2010. Where, where were they based? They were based in, uh, on the peninsula, actually, okay. yeah, in the Bay Area. Um, and we thought it was like a really, really funny website. It's like give your car a little mojo, add a, add a mustache to it. And, and so we, we ordered a few for the office. So if you see sort of old Zimride company photos, we always had this, this big orange mustache. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when we were first launching, you know, we thought, what's something we could do, uh, one, to get people's attention, and two, to kind of set the tone that this is, you know, a fun service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't take ourselves too seriously. And, uh, and so we said, it was, you know, John said, you know, let's give like, a bright pink mustache to every driver and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't know if the drivers would actually put them on, but everybody was excited to do it. And in the, in the very beginning, it was, it was like you were a celebrity. So I, you know, I started driving early on. And if you were in a lift, uh, it would turn heads. You know, people were you know, thinking, what, what is that? And it also helps you identify when somebody's you know, pulling up to the curb to pick you up. Right, you it's know, also practical. Really cool. yeah. Yeah. The best thing for us was when we, would, we saw this sort of tip in a handful of cities, usually about three months in, the city would hit like a mustache tipping point where someone would, in a single day, see two or three mustaches in a row. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they start asking, like, what, what is going on here? There can't just be one you know, lunatic out on the road. Uh, there's got to so be a So what trip. is the mustache tipping point? What, what percentage of adoption? Um, I forget the numbers. I think, I don't know, if you get 1,000 or 2,000 drivers on the road in a city, that's, okay. that's roughly. And now, now you have a glow stash that's replacing the, the pink mustache in the front. Yep, so just a couple months ago, uh, the mustache turns out it didn't weather very well. Uh, uh, played better on the west coast than the than the east coast, uh, and drivers were getting you know it was fun in the beginning, but drivers were getting tired of taking it on and off of their car. 
So we, uh, we brought it inside, shrunk it down, and it lights up now. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get to uh, the elephant in the room right now. Um, so let's, let's see a show of hands. How many people have ever ridden in an Uber? Which is a, a little bit more than, um, than raise their hands for Lyft. Um, Lyft is now in about a quarter of the cities that Uber is. It's ra you've raised about a, a one-seventh of the capital. And I think that when people use these two services, they uh, quickly realize that there's a lot of parity on the features. Um, in one case, you know, the, the carpooling options that you uh, introduced and that Uber introduced came out literally within hours, of, they were announced within hours of each other. An announced. <laughs> announced. Um, and so the question is, what can you do? Is it possible for you to catch Uber? And what's your advantage in this race? Yeah, so I think we have completely different visions for the world, and we, we operate very differently. So, uh, you know, I think Uber is, is a good car service, right? And that's exactly what they were when we launched. Uh, and when we launched Lyft, uh, UberX didn't exist, uh, and they launched that several months later, uh, and ultimately followed us into the peer-to-peer -peer space, uh, because they realized, you know, that was the most important area of the market. Similarly, when we launched Lyft Line about six months ago, they announced on the same day uh, without a product and then followed into the market. So, uh, you know, they, they're a good car service and very interested in logistics uh, and then, you know, following a number of our moves. But our, our vision for the world is uh, completely different and we're going after a very different opportunity. So our, our vision for the world is, uh, you know, making car ownership unnecessary. So we never set out to create a better taxi cab, right? And if you think, you know, we set out to, to make, make a huge impact, and if you think, think about the size of the markets, the taxi and limo market in the US is $11 billion. But US consumers spend over $2 trillion on transportation every year, and almost all of that is spent on people's personal cars. Two trillion, that's 20% of a household's budget it's the second highest household expense. It is massively expensive. And what we're doing with Lyft is trying to make that unnecessary, trying to reduce the amount that people have to spend on transportation so that it's not such a burden on families, and uh, open up a possibility where you can have you know, the convenience and an even better experience getting around uh, than, than using your own car. And I think Do you think that Uber's not doing the same thing? They're not going after the same goal of replacing car ownership? You know, I, I think they, you know, their, their original motto was everybody's private driver. And I just don't think you can, uh, you know, most, most of the population cannot afford a private driver. And so what we're doing is, you know, relentlessly innovating to bring the price point down. Mm -hmm. and, and it, you know, we've had a, a lot of success with some of the new products we've launched in those areas. Uh, so. You know, six months ago when we launched Lyft, Lyft Line, um, it was you know another another idea that no, nobody knew whether or not people wanted this or if it would work. But we offered you know rides at half the, the cost of a normal Lyft, and we would match people up with two or three people on their same route. So people request from different different places, enter in their destination, and we you know the, we would send the driver, pick one person up go pick a second person up, making sure the detour was never more than a few minutes. And uh, you know, the question was, would, would people be willing to go a few minutes out of their way? You had to be, the, the user experience is very different, so you have to be outside waiting for the driver when they come, uh, and they won't sort of deviate for you. You have to, you get locked into sort of like a transit line. Uh, and uh, the service has exploded uh, to the point where it now makes up the majority of rides in San Francisco. Um, that's something we've, we've never, never talked about before. As of when, when is that? So that's as of what the, period the, does that the cover? beginning of the year. OK, since the beginning of the year, since majority of rides in San Francisco are lift, are on lift, lift line. line. OK, um, and that's, uh, that's, to be fair, partly you've, you've offered a promotional um, price for this. They've been $5 per ride, right? So that was, we actually, it, they became the majority of our rides before we oh, offered before the that. promotion, okay. and now it's significantly over the majority of the rides that we do. Okay. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is the lesson we learned when we first, you know, launched Lyft, uh, and that we learned again with Lyft Line, 
that every dollar you knock off of the price opens it up to this gigantic market of people. So if you imagine this like hmm. little taxi and limo market and this giant, you know, consumer transportation automobile market of two trillion dollars, every dollar you knock off the price of a lift, you start taking huge chomps. And I think this is why, you know, a lot of the sort of investor community has been blown away by the types of growth uh, that we've seen. It's because it's it's so much bigger uh, than that you know, kind of for higher transportation market. And it sounds like LiftLine is also going back to kind of your original insight when you're sitting in traffic in LA of how do you get more people to fill these seats in the cars. Yeah, absolutely. And we uh, sort of on top, so, so we're launching all of these cool things around LiftLine. So we really see kind of LiftLine as a platform that we build on. And it, it's really, it's set a different user experience expectation. Right, so you, you plug in your destination, you have to be outside on the curb waiting, but the things we can do with that uh, are, are really exciting. So we launched a, a service called Driver Destination. Mm -hmm. So as a driver, you know, if we want to get every car on the road to be a lift, uh, we, we need to make it incredibly convenient for drivers. And so drivers now can plug in their destination. Um, so when I'm headed into work in the morning, I'll flip into driver destination mode. Uh, and get matched with somebody else who's requesting a lift line ride mm -hmm. along that route. Uh, so the other day, you know, I picked somebody up um, and made 20 bucks on my way into work. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is this is a week after raising 530 million dollars in capital. Every every dollar <laughs> counts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's actually talk about that. So you raised uh, 530 million dollars in capital. Uh, you have now raised nearly a billion, I think, somewhere between 700 and a billion. Yeah, so we've raised just, just over 800 okay. million. Um, which is a lot, but you know, in this space, there's a lot of capital being raised, a lot of money going into this. I guess the first question is, why do you need to raise so much money? What, what are your costs? Where is this money going? Yeah, so, so if you think about this, this network uh, that we're building, it, a great parallel is the wireless industry. So it's phenomenally expensive to put up 4G, 4G cell phone towers across the country, right? AT&T and Verizon invest billions and billions of dollars to create that level of coverage. Uh, and for us, uh, our cell towers are having drivers and having a great driver about three minutes away. That's, that's the network. And once you have you know, a great reliable driver just a few minutes away, uh, you have the network to operate and to compete. And, and when you're in that space, you're, you know, you're competing on uh, experience and brand uh, and the different types of services that you offer. So Lyft is heavily investing in you know, all of our cities, putting up our cell phone towers. And that's, that's the foundation of the service. So there's... So what's the equivalent of a cell phone tower? What goes into creating this? What are you, what are you actually spending the money on? Yeah, so it's, it's scale, right? So, <clears throat> So scale creates market liquidity. So you need to operate at scale so that a driver who flips into driver mode gets a ride quickly. And if they get a ride quickly, they'll stay on the platform and you know, it'll keep making great money for them. A passenger needs to open up the app and have a driver nearby. So you know, if, you, if you think about it, if you have 10, 10 drivers in a city, right, the closest driver you know, is probably gonna be 10, 15 minutes away. But if you have 100 drivers in a city, uh, you know, on at the same time, then the nearest driver may be two or three minutes away. So uh, it's not, you don't need, you know, gigantic scale, but you need significant scale in each city to have liquidity. Uh, but once you hit that scale, there's diminishing returns. So, you know, just like if, you know, a cell phone company puts up another few towers, it doesn't really matter as long as they have capacity for the number of you know, of users that they have. So is part of this giving, uh, paying up for incentives to get more drivers on the platform and to, to subsidize the, the cost of, of uh, riding in a lift for passengers? Yeah, so it's not subsidy cost, but it's acquisition on both sides of the huh. marketplace. So it's driver acquisition and it's passenger acquisition. And you do the, you know, both of them uh, intensely at the same time, and that gets the market to scale. Mm -hmm. I think there's a little bit of a concern with um, this space that a lot of the kind of luxury and convenience of riding in an Uber and Lyft 
um, is owed to the fact that you guys have raised so much money and that some of the, the, the cost of that great experience is being kind of subsidized by this venture capital influx into this space. Um, do you see a path to profitability um, in, 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 in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. So, so we are already profitable in our top markets, our most mature markets. Which ones? So San Francisco, uh, LA, Chicago, uh, and a couple others. When did you reach profitability on those? Uh, towards, towards the end of last year. OK. And uh, you know, every, every ride. And sorry, this is out of, you're, out, you're in a total of 68 cities, right? Uh, 65 cities okay. now. So the vast yeah. majority of cities, still, you're still not profitable. Yeah, the vast majority of cities. Uh, so, so almost every ride, we're profitable on when you look at the unit economics. Uh, so we make money on each ride. But we are profitable in those most mature markets when you consider acquisition costs. So when you get in a ride, and as long as you're paying for it, uh, that ride is profitable for us. If you're taking one of your first rides and it's a free ride, that's an investment in bringing the market to scale. Mm -hmm. um, so I just uh, read my favorite publication, one of my favorite publications, TechCrunch, uh, which broke a story at, literally as we were walking down here. Um, and Ryan Lawler wrote that you are, where did I write this down? Uh, you're expecting $1 billion in gross revenue this year. That's, bef that's before you pay out um, drivers and other costs. And then targeting $2.7 billion in gross revenue next year. And that you're not predicting a profitability until 2016. And he cited this was information that you're telling potential investors. Uh, any comment for us? You want to confirm those numbers for us right here? <laughs> So I cannot com comment on any of the uh, confidential leaked documents that Ryan got a hold of. Uh, but who's his I source? You know, I, I do think uh, I do think that they they demonstrate that we're going through a period of intense rapid growth. So I can't say we uh, we grew uh, nationally five x year over year in 2014. Great. Um, so we uh, have about 15 more, 10 more minutes, and we're going to take some questions. So we're going to take those just from Twitter. So if you haven't yet, if you have a burning question for Logan Green, the CEO of Lyft, make sure you tweet it to hashtag AskLogan. We're going to take those in about 12 minutes. Uh, let's see. Drivers. OK. So there's a lot of, uh, how many drivers do you have? So there's hundreds of thousands of drivers on the road. Not not citing exact numbers on okay. that front. Who are uh, these people? The drivers. It, it's fascinating. Uh, so I'm a driver, uh, but there is a whole mix of, of people from folks who do this, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, uh, to folks who do this, you know, a couple hours a day or just on their way into work. Uh, our average driver is doing it about 15 hours a week, um, and you know, there's, uh, you know. A, I think the, the nature of, of work is changing, and the sharing economy is kind of ushering in a new era. Uh, there's a line I love that flexibility is the new stability. And people aren't looking uh, you know, for the same thing out of, out of their careers and their jobs uh, at this point. And flexibility is such a huge value to folks. So you know, our drivers are uh, you know, in LA, 60% of our drivers work in the creative industry. So an actor, a musician, um, a writer, and they're using Lyft uh, you know, to fill the gaps in between jobs. Um, you know, when their agent calls them and they want to go, you know, they have to drop everything and, and go on an audition because acting is their dream and they're pursuing their passion. Uh, they sign out of driver mode and jump on it. Mm -hmm. And they can drive whenever they want. Mm -hmm. um, other folks you know, first move into a town and are looking to get connected. Uh, you know, in San Francisco, everybody moves there to start a business, right? 30% of our drivers in San Francisco are entrepreneurs, and they use Lyft to network, uh, to, you know, pitch, you might get pitched on their, their business in a Lyft. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I met a Jamaican woman who had just moved to San Francisco with her sister, uh, and she was driving Lyft to save up money to open a Jamaican food restaurant. Her sister was, was a chef, mm. uh, and she gave me her card and said, you know, come, come visit us when we open up. Uh, um, at the same time, there are some drivers who are starting to be more vocal about um, the fact that they are working what is to them, to some of these people, like a full-time job, but not getting 
um, the benefits or some of the, you know, the compensation that a full-time employee would be. If these, um, and there's a, there's a lawsuit, a couple of lawsuits working their way through the system right now that essentially are alleging just this. So I know you can't talk about the lawsuit directly here in this context, but um, is there, if these people are so important to your business, why do you treat them as, uh, why do you employ them as contractors as opposed to full-time workers? And why is that important? Yeah, so, so they, the driver community is, is the lifeblood of our business and it's incredibly important to us. Uh, you know, part of the beauty of Lyft is that you know, we, we've created you know, a stringent but very fast driver onboarding process. So you can go through all of these you know, strict checks uh, in you know, like very little time, uh, which makes it incredibly appealing to folks who want to do it just for a short time. And you know, we, it, we never wanted you know, to create just a better, a better taxi experience. So the idea wasn't to only cater to folks who are doing this full time. You know, if that's how we were you know, operating, it would be a very different business. Uh, and we want to make it flexible so that people can do it whenever they want, however they want, using, you know, everybody's using their own cars. Um, so, and, you know, ultimately pushing this vision of every car on the road being able to be a lift, right? When I flip into driver mode on my way, way into work, I, I do not, you know, of course I have an employment relationship with Lyft, but, <laughs> but you know, as, as, you know, someone just heading into the, into the office, I don't want, you know, it's an employment relationship with that company, right? Just like, you know, a host for Airbnb uh, doesn't imagine an employment relationship. Is with there the a company. tension, though, uh, for you, maybe even for other sharing economy companies, between wanting to give them that flexibility and having a model that's based on them having that flexibility, and then also needing them to do some things, um, to act a certain way or to behave a certain way, um, to make sure that you have kind of, they are representing the Lyft brand? Is there a tension between those two things? Not, not at all. And I think it, it creates, uh, you know, uh, a much, much more dynamic system. So, you know, folks drive whenever they want, and the earnings are higher during the busiest times, right? And so folks drive, uh, you know, if they don't care about exactly how much they're making, maybe they'll drive during a slower time. If they care a lot more, they'll drive during the busiest times. Um, you know, if they like, you know, uh, having a certain style within the car, they can have whatever style they want within the car. We don't dictate that they you know, act a certain way. But a passenger you know, gives them feedback on the experience at the end of each trip. Uh, and, and we send that. Uh, so something you know, a lot of folks might not be aware of is we bundle all feedback and comments to drivers, and we send it anonymously once a week. Uh, so it can never be traced back to the specific individual. But those comments people leave for drivers are sent directly to them. So Lyft is about. Do you review those comments as well? Uh, we we have our data science team has built something so we you know review it for any sort of keywords. Okay, your computers scan yeah. them. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but Lyft stays out of out of the middle of that system and it goes directly to the driver. And so we're you know we're we're here to create an extremely efficient and fair marketplace. Um, and I think, I think that, that gives the system the flexibility it needs. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, just one more reminder. We're going to start asking questions in about four minutes. Um, you, oh, going back. So I don't, I don't remember seeing your hand go up when I asked uh, who in the audience has used an Uber. Have you, have you taken <laughs> an Uber before? <laughs> uh, I have. Not, not in a couple of years, though. Okay. Yeah. Um, I believe my account was disabled. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Have you called to, to ask about that? Or? No, I didn't follow up on it. <laughs> that, was, that was all right. Have they been, is that a thing? Have they been disabling Lyft employees' ca uh, accounts? Uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's, there's a back and forth there. OK. Um, there's a fun history between you two guys, or you two companies, and um, you give us a lot to write about. Um, Let's start with the poaching. Um, have you, um, or has your competitor engaged in kind of poaching behavior to kind of get drivers from the other um, side to join you? And uh, do you, I mean, it's, it's kind of, do you think that they've, you've crossed, you or your competitor have crossed any ethical lines in, in this behavior? Um, yeah, so, so there are plenty of drivers who drive for both platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think both of us encourage that. I think as a, as a driver, 
Um, you know, there, there are plenty of reasons that someone might want to drive for both platforms, and that's, you know, part of, um, you know, the, the definition of an independent contractor is you often have multiple, you know, jobs that you're working on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, so, yeah, there are plenty of, you know, drivers who drove for Uber first, and then we pulled them over to Lyft, and there are plenty of, you know, drivers who started with Lyft first and got pulled over to Uber, um, and a lot in the middle that, that keep doing both. So, you know, n neither platform was set up for exclusivity. Uh -huh. But are there certain ways you can incentivize them to be exclusive? Uh, we, we, have, we have a handful of programs, yeah, to reward the mm -hmm. most loyal drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, so drivers who drive, uh, you know, more hours for Lyft can earn back chunks of their commission, mm -hmm. um, all the way up, you know, to earning their entire commission mm -hmm. back. Um, and we found that's, you know, a great, great way to mm -hmm. reward the most loyal drivers. Mm -hmm. Um, let me put a finer point on this. Your, one of your investors, Peter Thiel, has been on the record um, frequently saying that Uber has an, is a very unethical company and, and part of their kind of behavior around things like poaching drivers has bordered on unethical. Do you agree with him? Yeah, they've, they've crossed a handful of lines. So, uh, Which ones? <laughs> so uh, it's not something I can go into, but there's, there's a lawsuit uh, pending. So. Is this the... Um, the one re related to an executive leaving Lyft and, and joining Uber? Yeah, exactly. Taking some secret financials with them. Maybe he gave them to Ryan Lawler. Maybe that's where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what else should I ask? Oh, okay, international. Um, you, so part, you're not focused on international right now, but you are plotting maybe your first uh, international expansion this year. Where is that going to be? Yeah, so, so we don't have any specific cities to announce, uh, but we're very excited about uh, the investors that we brought on both in last round with Alibaba and Rakuten coming in mm -hmm. to, to lead this round. Um, so I think they're, they're incredibly exciting international opportunities. Um, and so that's, that's to, to be announced. Um, uh, are you, so, your so Uber is in d dozens of cities internationally and there are you know, a lot of uh, local um, competitors in India and China and a lot of these markets that are already starting to gain significant traction. Yeah. Um, are you at all concerned by sitting out uh, international expansion right now, or to the extent that you have, that you're going to fall behind? And is it going to be difficult for you to catch up when you, if and when you do want to go into those markets? No, no, I think, I think with, with the right partners, you can, you can go in and make, make a big impact. Uh, I think we're, we're learning a lot now from, uh, there are, you know, extremely large uh, international competitors. So the two big players in China, uh, I believe, have a combined valuation of about $7 billion now. And they're in uh, the process of merging. They're in the process of merging, yeah. Kwaidi and uh, Didi. <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's a giant that's dominating you know, the Chinese marketplace. Uh, in India, you have Ola. Um, in Southeast Asia, you have Grab Taxi. Uh, and all these companies are, you know, the, the local favorite and the don dominant player there. And so as we, as we go international, um, you know, we're, we're looking to, to add something unique to the market um, and not just go there. These, the, the international players, the other thing to recognize is that they're typically built uh, just on sort of as a taxi platform. Um, and so when we do go international, uh, it won't be, just be as sort of a taxi service. Mm -hmm it'll be bringing really the pieces that are most unique about Lyft uh, to the rest of the world. Uber is struggling in a lot of these markets. Yeah, it's a story that, that doesn't get told a lot, but they have low single digit market share uh, in all of these countries with, with no immediate sign of um, being able to really make a dent. So I don't, I don't think their current strategy is working and we'll, we'll see what they do. I mean, could it benefit you just to sit back and watch kind of, you know, how they go about it and where they fail and where they succeed? Yeah, absolutely. We're, I think we're learning a lot right now. <laughs> Great. Um, we have some questions coming in. Let me see if I... Oh, um, self-driving cars. Uh, one of Uber's investors, Bill Gurley, was on this stage yesterday and said that you know, maybe it's going to be longer than people think a little bit. What, do, what is your prediction on self-driving cars and what... Uh, uh, how soon and what role does Lyft play in that world? Yeah, so I think I mean, the, it's an incredibly exciting uh, future. 
I think what, what we're seeing come to market now and you know, evolve and mature in the next few years are sort of partial self-driving cars. So this is what Tesla announced, this is what Mercedes is coming out with, where you essentially get on the freeway, get in a lane, and it's like augmented cruise control where you can flip in and take your hands off the wheel. Um, the risk with that is you, know, you have to be there to quickly put your hands back on the wheel. Uh, and as far as our business is concerned, self-driving cars are, you know, only make a difference uh, to folks when the car can fully drive itself, navigate around a city without anybody sitting there, without anybody needing to jump in and take control. And, and so that, that product uh, you know, is you know, a few more years down the road than the current versions we're, we're starting to see. I think we'll, we'll see the current technology rapidly evolve and improve to where people you know, are having to intervene less and less. Um, but you know, and no, nobody knows the year, right? Talk to a ton of people you know, who are actively working on you know, self-driving cars. It, it poses and, great um, uh, change for your, I mean, you, what, what is Uber, what is Lyft's um, role in this world? I mean, it, what does it mean for your drivers who are essentially yeah. out of work, right? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, as we talk about this sort of evolution, you know, as we're taking these chomps into this $2 trillion consumer transportation market, uh, I think when self-driving cars come out, it's not, not just our industry that's gonna change, but the entire auto industry. So I don't think the majority of people will buy a self-driving car, right? When it's fully autonomous, I think the majority of people will hit a button in an app, request a self-driving car, it'll come up, take them to wherever they wanna go. And <clears throat> it's gonna be so much cheaper and so much more convenient uh, than having to own a car and park a car uh, that I think most people will opt for using one as transportation as a service. Mm -hmm. And that is gonna lead to I think what's going to be the most sort of radical reinventing of cities that we see in our lifetime. So, you know, there's this crazy stat. Half of LA is dedicated to automobiles, whether it's freeways, streets, parking lots. Physically. Physically, the physical infrastructure, 50% is dedicated to cars. And the average city has four parking spaces for every one car. And so you can, you can imagine when, you know, people aren't having to, you know, own and park these cars, uh, you know, the streets get narrowed. You need fewer lanes. Yeah. They're not lined with cars. You don't have giant parking lots. What do you say to your drivers, though, who, I mean, they will be out of work when this happens? You know, I think the, it's, again, not, not just our drivers. It's the entire auto industry. It's, uh, the entire economy is shifting. So if you, if you look back, right, a little over 100 years, 150 years ago, 80% of the economy was employed in agriculture, right? Now a couple percent are, mm -hmm. right? Economies shift and the meaning of work shifts, you know, massively over time. And it doesn't mean that, you know, is that those economy, you know, economic shifts take decades to play out. Uh, and as they do, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, 10, 20, 30% of the population is sitting around out of work. Mm -hmm. It means that the type of jobs that are available and the type of work that happens shifts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think things, things will change and uh, we're here to, ho you know, to, to help, you know, make sure that they change in a, in a positive direction. Maybe they'll be helping to program the computers that will do all this. Um, we're we're going to go to some Twitter questions now. The first one um, is, I think, and I think we've kind of addressed a little, little bit of this, but beyond cars on the road, what do you envision the ripple effect of ride sharing to be in the U.S.? So I think some, some of the, the ripple effects, what, what falls out of this, uh, you know, with less cars on the road, traffic goes away. Uh, with less money spent uh, on transportation, uh, people have more disposable income to spend in other areas of, of their life. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think one, one thing that we care a ton about at Lyft is bringing people together. And so all of a sudden, as, you know, the best transportation option out there is a social one where you're with other people, uh, you know, I think that the sort of social fabric of our community strengthens. And that's one of the, the most exciting sort of, you know, ripple effects of this. Mm -hmm. um, next question, what, what's your official stance on lift etiquette when riding alone, front seat or back seat? <laughs> I'm glad we got this question. So <laughs> in the very beginning, uh, 
we suggested that people sit in the front seat. And we really wanted to establish a culture in Lyft about drivers and passengers treating each other really well. Uh, and I think we, we've set a really solid foundation for that culture. Um, and at this point, you know, Lyft in 65 cities, uh, you know, we're giving rides to all sorts of different folks every day. Uh, and saying you, know, you had to sit in the front seat was too limiting. So we open it up and we say, look, Lyft is about uh, you know, treating people well. It's about being yourself. Lift however you want, but be nice to each other. Mm -hmm. And you also said that you no longer request that people do a fist bump with the driver, which used to be kind of a standard lift greeting. Is something lost though when you when you remove these things, or you, when you say people don't have to do this? Is this part was this part of kind of what made Lyft a, a, a unique uh, brand from the others in the market? Yeah, I think I definitely think it's it's a essential ingredient of our culture, um, and you know our core base. Lo loves that and engages with it. But even, you know, even talking to folks you know, in our, our core base, you know, even talking to folks internally, sometimes you feel like sitting in the front and having a conversation, and other times you're tired after a long day of work or you're on a date and you want to you know, sit back and read your email or you know, have, a, have a conversation with your date. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't want to be overly prescriptive about how it had to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think we have that that kind of foundation of people being good to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any data on whether people sit in the front and the back? We don't have any. Yeah, we, we, we survey drivers once in a while to get a read on it. Uh, um, I think it's about 50-50, that's my best guess. Has it changed significantly since you sent the email? Uh, we don't have sort of data that precise okay. on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, which do you, what's your default mode? Do you sit in the front or the back? I'd say I sit in the front probably 80% of the time. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes if I'm heading to a meeting or prepping for something, uh, I'll sit in the back. Are they usually surprised when it's the CEO of Lyft? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> most of the time they don't know. My photo shows up with the green background that drivers have. Uh -huh. So that's like the one, uh, one giveaway. The, and we'll just start uh -huh. talking about trading notes about driving. Huh. Yeah. Uh, the, next, uh, the next question, oh, what kind of car do you drive? Uh, I drive a, a Nissan Leaf. So, and Great. A little electric car. It's all electric. Nice. Yep. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Although, you can only give a handful of lift rides before you have to recharge it. So. Oh. It's <laughs> <laughs> good to know. Do we have another question? Uh, how, how do you guarantee a consistent customer experience mm -hmm. across cities and drivers while expanding so fast? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so in the very beginning, uh, my co-friend and I would meet with every single applicant in the San Francisco mm -hmm. office. And uh, you know, we were obsessive over this, you know, creating this amazing experience. And his background, he went to the Cornell Hotel School. His background is in hospitality. Mm -hmm. uh, John. And he, John. Yeah. And he, uh, he really obsesses over this. Um, as we scaled, one of the biggest challenges was figuring out how do you take a really high touch process mm -hmm. uh, and scale it across the country and do it, you know, at hu huge volume. And you know, we spent probably the first two years of the business, this was the largest problem that we were solving. Mm -hmm. And so you know, what we ended up building was what we call our mentor system. So in each market, the top 20% of drivers, so the very best, and this is by passenger, passenger rating, so the very top drivers become eligible to be mentors. And they'll go through sort of a separate onboarding process where they learn about mentoring new applicants. And then after, a, a mentor, after a, an applicant has gone through all the sort of automated checks, they're matched up with one of these mentors, some of the best folks in the community. They get together in person, and they spend you know, about you know, 45 minutes to an hour together. And that mentor is the first passenger for the driver. Uh, and they go around and you know, do a lift. They do a, you know, a vehicle inspection. And the mentor you know, onboards them and lets them know what it means to be a lift driver. What's in it for the mentor? So the mentor gets paid, uh, you know, I think in most cities it's 35 bucks a pop uh, per mentor session that they is, do. Is that more than they would make in a normal ride? Uh, you know, it's, it depends on sort of the time of day and all, but yeah, it's sort of at that, the higher end of what they typically mm -hmm. make in an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we were talking to, to our Lyft driver yesterday, uh, who was a mentor, yeah. um, and she, she, her answer to this question was, yes, she, she does it for the extra money that she gets, but that she actually believes in kind of the you know, as, as corny as it sounds to me, the you know the future of kind of this community of Lyft and Lyft drivers, and she you know she feels like what she's giving 
um, back her time and energy into something that's going to help kind of sustain, you know, this this uh, this job for her essentially. Yeah, yeah. The mentors have this feeling of ownership over the community, and by playing this role in onboarding every single new driver, they get to continue to shape the mm -hmm. community and make sure that the bar stays really high. Is it tougher to, to keep uh, really consistent uh, safety standards when you're relying on uh, you know these? independent contractors to bring on board and to do some of the initial, at least, inspections for this? No, so we've, we, we've automated, you know, all of the, the critical, you know, criminal background checks, and DMV checks, uh, you know, and, you know, have third parties processing every photo. So, you know, the underlying infrastructure of it is, you know, all automated. And then each mentor has to go through a prescribed checklist uh, so we make sure that every point that needs to get hit is hit. Mm -hmm. So there's like a, a very high degree of certainty. So they're the, the first process. line, not the last line. Yeah. Um, exactly. The next question is Lyft is known to have a much better work culture than Uber. Uh, what, what does it take to build this great culture? And I, you know, I think that that's obviously a subjective um, question, but I will say when I you know, tend to get into Lyfts and Ubers and do my informal interviews of the drivers, Typically, Lyft drivers say really nice things about Lyft. Um, Uber drivers usually have some kind of like you know beef with Uber. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, uh, so I think it's a good question. What you know, what how did you get to that point? What you know, what's how do you get that kind of right? Yeah, we put a ton of emphasis on culture internally within the company, uh, and believe that that you know uh, has to project all the way out to the driver and passenger experience. Um, so you know, some of the sort of key key values to the culture. Uh, we want people to, to be themselves, always be, be honest and open. Uh, so, you know, if you disagree about something, uh, speak up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in, internally we're all headed towards the same, trying to accomplish the same mission, mm -hmm. right? Of rebuilding our, our transportation infrastructure, you know, eliminating traffic, making it possible to get around without a car. And so, when you have you know, people who disagree about something, it's fine to disagree and to be open and honest, but create that open two-way communication. Um, and, and that's you know, the same experience we bring to the driver community where you know, we don't tell people, you know, act a certain way. Uh, we say, be yourselves, be comfortable. You know, give lifts as a driver the way you, you feel comfortable and as a passenger the mm -hmm. same. And then you know, feel very comfortable giving open two-way feedback to each other, mm -hmm. and that's through the you know rating and the comment system. Mm -hmm. um, and I think through that type of system of being very you know open and clear about you know what you stand for, what you care about, um, and letting other other people know, but then being able to take that feedback yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we're uh, we're running out of time. I have one more uh, question. Um, we talked about you. Um, I read an article that said that you have 15 out of your top 30 female, or top 30 executives are female, which yeah. is drastically higher than most technology companies. Yeah. Uh, and since we're, this is kind of a, you know, I think this is sort of a theme of some of the programming here at South by that we're kind of having this conversation about diversity and how how do we, you know, how do we fix this problem of a lack of diversity in our industry? Yeah. Um, what kind of insights or tips would you give? To, is that the result of a deliberate effort to, to get to that place? Or what kind, and what kind of tips could you give you know, tech companies who are looking at this problem and trying to find solutions right now? No, I think we, we were honestly shocked when uh, uh, Kira, our CMO, r ran the numbers mm -hmm. uh, and saw that 47% yeah, of director level and above uh, in our company you know, were, were women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think. We've always wanted to build a culture of being extremely inclusive, um, and women have always been like an incredibly important part of our platform. The majority of our passengers are women, and 30% of our drivers are also women. Uh, so it's essential uh, that we have you know, you know, enough women on the team to, uh, to have insight into that to make sure you know we don't make. This types of boneheaded decisions that companies who you know have all male uh, teams make, um, and I think we've we've seen huge benefits from having that that mix. Um, but no, we were honestly uh, surprised when we when we saw that number and then seeing how different it was than most other companies. Cool. Well, thanks uh, so much for joining us. Uh, let's have a hand for Logan Green.
is it crazy to think that the personal robot's path into the home in a mass consumer way will be because of its relationship with the people who live there. And that's really been what my life's work has been about. So when I think about personal robots, for me, it's a profoundly social technology.